please visit mypersonalrabbi.com for all of the latest Kabbalah news, classes, videos, and more. Actually, on a deeper level, what do we mean when we say a deeper level? Every person is comprised of two components according to Kabbalah, a body and a soul. The soul is as complementary to the body as a perfect glove that fits. The match between a soul and a body. If you don't get along with your own soul, everything is going to be out of line. Aligning our body with our soul is the first key to a healthy life and to a healthy way of perceiving ourselves and the world around us. According to Kabbalah, the soul is comprised with as many components as the body has. Specifically, 365 components that has to do with the blood flow and 248 parts of the body. Interestingly enough, if you add those two numbers together, you get 613. 248 and 365. These two components comprise the entire physical body and they comprise a corollary in the spiritual side. So we refer to the soul as having 613 components. There's a match between the body and the soul for every one of those 613 components. Knowing the spiritual part is the root from which the cure can come to the body. So if somebody has an illness uh, in the ear, for example, knowing the spiritual counterpart of where is the match, we fix the problem in the source, and then the problem goes away in the effect. You take the cause away, and the effect is gone. Easier said than done, of course. If we know exactly how to fix it, we'd go and solve the world's problems. It's much, much more complex than that. But part of learning Kabbalah, part of learning the practical application of Kabbalah, is applying these concepts to our life. And amazingly, we find that many people who try, on a very simple level, some of these comparisons or connections we find incredible results. And hopefully as Kabbalah becomes more known, just like the sciences in the early 1900s or late 1800s, we know now many, many more levels of knowledge than doctors who were just starting out and learning basic things about the human body. Same things with Kabbalah. We're just at the beginning of Kabbalah becoming world known and becoming more and more studied. And as we develop, as we uncover this, uh, this concealed flower, which we call Kabbalah, more and more knowledge is going to be brought to the world. There's a big controversy now in the medical world whether prayer has an impact in people's health. There's actually a study that's been done over a period of time, of years, that they show that people, prayer, even if the patient didn't know that prayers were made for them, prayer groups and church meetings and all kinds of various things, and they show, look at what's done. Who organized this um, study? A church group. Okay, they have an agenda. So it was already tainted, and now there's a whole argument in the scientific community whether this should be a, mod a modified study, and it's a report that was based upon that. We know the result, now let's find a way how to fill it in. But whatever that report impact was on the world, and I'm sure there are others that are being introduced and were introduced, that no, there is no question that a person with a healthy attitude will heal faster and live longer and happier than someone with not a good attitude. Bernie Siegel, famous doctor in the uh, cancer community, talks about living a life after a person is diagnosed, and that has a literal impact in days, months, and years to add on to a person's life, versus somebody who succumbs to their illness, overwhelmed by it, <coughs> angry at the world, 
or whatever else, and as a result of that, can't smile for anything because the whole world owes them an apology because they have cancer. And they don't live long, unfortunately. So Kabbalah says, if we take it to the root and find what is the cause, where is this originating from, how can we tend to heal this? In the second part of this series, which is going to be next week, the conclusion of this subject, we will give some practical advice, I'll give some books that we would suggest that we read uh, to further these concepts and where more information can be known about it. And hopefully, with God's help, I'll have a handout ready for you. This was all part of the original plan for tonight, but, you know, there's a Yiddish expression, the man stracht and got lacht. In Yiddish, in English, that means that man plans and God has other plans. You know, it doesn't always work the way you want to. And that's part of what Kabbalah teaches. You have to learn how to give up. You can't try to control everything in your life. Some things will not be the way you planned it to be. You just have to realize that we have to do everything in our power to do it right, and then the rest we leave up to a higher power. What is healing? Where does it begin? How do we start? There's an ancient Kabbalistic book which we mentioned many times, and we'll use it throughout our classes. Unfortunately, there isn't a very well translation of it in English. <coughs> although there are translations in it, none of them that I recommend at this time. <coughs> the book is called The Zohar. According to ancient Kabbalistic tradition, there was a rabbi that lived in the first century. His name was Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. This rabbi saw the effects of the destruction of the temple. If you want to compare in our days, it would be like a Holocaust survivor. But in those days, to see the temple being destroyed by the Romans and his teacher being uh, raked uh, to death with iron combs in front of his eyes was something that he never forgave the Romans for. And he spoke out publicly against them. And since they ran the country, to the victor, you know, is the textbooks of the story, of the history, they were still in control after the destruction of the temple. They won the war, so to speak. And he spoke against them. He was, he was the, you know, he was put out for. They said they wanted to have him a dead or alive. And he had to run into hiding. And he hid in a cave with his son Rabbi Elazar for twelve years, hiding from. They couldn't find him. And after a period of time, eventually the Romans uh, loosened their grip on the Jewish community and the, system, the, 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 the situation changed dramatically for the better. So Rabbi Shemar Yechai <coughs> is 12 years in the cave and then he went for the 13th year. He was there a total of 13 years. Comes out of the cave and what did he do for 12 years, 13 years? What did he spend his time doing? Studying. He couldn't take any books with him. As most scholars of those days, they did not rely on books for any of their information. Everything was by memory. They studied the entire Jewish scholarship in their mind. They knew it all by heart. There's even a story in the Talmud about one rabbi that had 60 students, and every one of the 60 students knew 1 60th of all the Jewish studies. And whenever he had a question about one of the subjects, oh, We'll go to Yankel, he knows this portion. We'll go to Shmerel, he knows that portion. And between the 60 students, he had all of it figured out. But this rabbi, Rabbi Shemel Yechai, had it all. All the 60 components, all in his own mind. Incredible, incredibly gifted person. So what he did in the 12 years is study the impact and the connection between these various points. One of the Hebrew words for the Talmud the individual chapters of the Talmud is called Mesechta. Mesechta is an Aramaic word which means one of the components, one of the sections of the Talmud. The word Mesechta means a mixture. A whole mixture of different things. Because you could learn one section of the Talmud and find many, many other things discussed. The section that's called Shabbat, you're going to have laws about 
different holidays. You can have laws about Hanukkah. And you can have laws about various things and historical information. So they're all mixed up of a variety of things all put together. So to be able to have the information in an orderly manner, you almost need a, uh, a computer mind to be able to see the entire scope of all the scholarship and put it all together. And Rav Shem is quoted very often in the Talmud on halachic matters, matters of Jewish law. But during the time of his um, stay in, in, in exile, self-imposed exile, not only can you see this as a negative, but he saw it as an incredible positive thing. That he was able to devote himself 100% of his waking hours to study. He didn't have a family. He didn't have personal needs. He didn't have communal needs. Any rabbi in any community, even if he doesn't take a public post, people will consult him. The more he's known to be someone who could be a teacher and an advisor, the more he'd be consulted and advised. They'll be his sought after. And he wouldn't be able to study. It's a mitzvah. We mentioned last class that if someone has knowledge and doesn't share it, it's a terrible sin. So it's a mitzvah to share the knowledge. It's a mitzvah on the one hand, but a distraction on the other. So here Rabbi Shem saw this opportunity for being completely removed from the world, not having any concerns about what's going on in the world, almost like Noah in the ark. Completely removed from any world issues and, some, and completely devoted to his study. And what came out of this was the book, the Zohar, which was speaking such deep concepts in mystical teachings and such secrets of the Torah that it was ordered to be hidden. And it was not found until the 13th century by a Spanish rabbi, and the whole story is how it became revealed and how it became written. But it, its original language is Aramaic, which was the common language of the Jewish people at that time. And I'm only giving this introduction because I will refer to this book of the Zohar in many different uh, times of the class, so it's important that those who will continue to be with the class or join, this context of knowing these sources is extremely important. And we also mentioned previously that there are many sources that I don't rely on because the authenticity is questionable. I don't feel that just because somebody wrote a book and write, wrote the, the cover, uh, j the jacket sleeve says Kabbalah, does it mean it's reliable? And I don't recommend that you study a book on Kabbalah unless you know that it's written by somebody who has bona fide real experience and knowledge in the origin of Kabbalah, not just uh, gleaned from some modern sources. So in this book of the Zohar, he writes as following, four Aramaic words, and it is specifically about healing. And like most things on Kabbalah, the words themselves may seem very simplistic, but understanding what they mean, that's where the wisdom lies. So he, the, the, the quote is like this, Chul de gufa tukfa de nishmasa which Aramaic means the weakness of the body is a strength for the soul. What does that mean? In another place in Kabbalah, it says the opposite. It says a small hole in the body means a big hole in the soul. The first phrase says the stronger the body, the weaker the soul. The stronger the soul, the weaker the body. Another phrase says a small hole in the in the body means a big hole in the soul. That means that a deficiency of the body means that there's a big deficiency in the soul. A small deficiency in the soul may create a big deficiency in the body. So let's understand what this means, because this is the core and the root of all illnesses that exist in the world and all illnesses that we have. <coughs> the word body in English physical body. But in Kabbalah, it's two different things. In Hebrew, it's, well, it's called guf. Guf means the body, the physical form. But there's two parts of this physical form when we talk about the physical form. Why were the Jewish people in the story of Hanukkah 
so opposed to sharing their intellectual knowledge with the Greeks, and so opposed to the Greeks imposing their intellectual knowledge on the Jewish people. When they put Zeus in the temple, the Jewish people went crazy. I, this is un, we cannot accept this. And Judah the Maccabee got up and says, this is the last stand, and he makes a, a whole revolt. And eventually the Greeks back off, and the temple is purified, and we have the holiday of Hanukkah. What's so bad about Zeus? And if you don't like Zeus, so Apollo, if you don't like Apollo, somebody else, what's the big deal? These Jewish people today who study Greek philosophy, so what? So, so this guy said, so, you know, Aristotle said this, and Socrates said that. So what's the deal? That makes you less Jewish? There's something wrong with that? Well, what's the big deal? What's the big war? Someone would come today and say, someone wants to bring a Greek book into the, into the shul, we're going to make a whole war, and we're going to take our arms, everyone's going to bring their guns and shoot the guy. So he brought a Greek book. So I would say, we don't believe in it. We don't agree with it. Maybe it has other points of view or whatever. What's the big war? And we make Hanukkah like, without Hanukkah, who knows where the Jewish people would be today? So the Zohar explains <coughs> that the Greeks emphasized the body in contradistinction to the soul. It wasn't that they said, you want to believe in the soul, believe in the soul. You want to believe in the body, believe in the body. The Greeks said the body is the strength of everything, and everything else is, is worthless. You're spending the time doing a mitzvah, the strength is. The strength is the physique of the physical body. This was the, the war. It was a war of ideology. The Greeks didn't go and massacre Jews. Only after the Jews made a revolt was there a war. The Greeks never bothered making a war. They just wanted to influence the Jewish people with their way of thinking. To Jewish people who followed the Torah, who saw the soul as primary, primary, and the body is secondary, this was a conflict. They couldn't live in both worlds. If you were Greek and followed that whole culture, then there was no point of doing a mitzvah. There was no point in making Kiddush Friday night. What are you sanctifying? Sanctify the body. Give the kid credit because he came home with uh, some more you know, physical features or he was able to win the, uh, throwing the disc another few hundred meters or whatever. That's where the power is. Not whether you know how to make Kiddush or you know how to read a Torah. What is that going to do for you? So there was a war where they wanted to stop any kind of spiritual influence. Where were the Greeks most offended with? Uh, circumcision. Uh, holidays like Shabbat. These are things where the Greeks found no value whatsoever. You want to run around and do a mitzvah and build up your energy? Sure. Using positive physical strength is wonderful. But as soon as the spiritual component was there... That's where the roads divided. So when we talk about the body, you can see the body is two separate things. One is the negative side of the body, and one is the positive side. The negative side of the body is seeing the body as primary and not having place for the soul. Spiritual value has no place, and the body takes all its Importance. It's the center of everything. The body is the most important, and then at this time, the soul also will find some room. Or if we don't, that's also okay. <laughs> the reverse is the soul is primary, and the body, who cares about? So Kabbalah walks a very fine line. Because if you follow the body as the primary and the soul as secondary, then you completely lose any spiritual value. If you say the soul is primary and the body is not important, you know what you lose? The whole point of doing a mitzvah. The whole point of doing a good deed is that the physical body is involved in doing something godly. The physical body is involved in doing something holy. So there were cults at the time of the Greeks. The opposite of the Greeks weren't the Jews. The opposite of the Greeks were the people who were completely ignoring the body. They believed in such a, a purified state of life that they say the less you can eat, the better you are. The less you have any contact with anything physical, the more holy you are. So no marriage, no food, as long as you possibly can, afflict your body. Anything that gives any strength to the body is forbidden. And 
the body became weakened, the body became completely ignored. And these cults, most of them never married, because marriage is something that brings pleasure to the body, so that was forbidden. Most of them didn't eat much at all, because food is giving energy to the body, and not supposed to give any credit to the body. It's all terrible. It's all trait. It's all forbidden. What was left? They died out. Many of these cults. <laughs> and unfortunately, you know, this doesn't have a lasting... You, know, you can't tell your kids around the table, stop eating. You know, that's... The Jewish views, you can't eat some more. The mom is giving the kid, you're going to die, but here's another piece of my kugel. You know, it's like, we have this big conflict. So Kabbalah is very interesting. It quotes both these two phrases, both phrases. On the one hand, we talk about the strength of the body is the weakness of the soul. That means the more emphasis you put on your body, the more you're taking away from the importance of the soul. And at the same time, a weakness of the body is a weak, a weaker body is a weaker soul. A stronger body is a stronger soul. So Kabbalah ignores both the Greek culture and its opposite. And it goes a completely different path. And says that a healthy person is a combination or a complete bonding between the 613 components of the soul and the 613 components of the body. Which part of the body is dispensable? No part. Which part of our day is dispensable? None. Every moment and every part of our body is sanctified. It has to be used for a higher purpose. The body becomes the vehicle, the means, the vessel, which is the term that Kabbalah uses. In Hebrew it's called a kli, the vessel, the container by which spiritual things get done. Spirits without bodies, souls without bodies, cannot do anything good. Cannot function. They cannot create goodness in the world. As much as a soul would yearn to do something good, it couldn't do anything. Only physically. So every single good deed, which is considered of having any spiritual value, all has to do with utilizing our body. The hand that picks up a penny and puts it in a charity box. The hand that reaches out to help another person as they're falling or after they're falling to pick them up. That hand cannot be a soul. The soul can't do that. The soul can see someone falling and it, it hopes that it could do something, but it can't. It needs a hand to go and do it. You can see a poor person, but you can't do anything if you don't have a hand. You don't have the means to fix. And therefore, Kabbalah sees the body as a very precious commodity that the soul has. If we make the body the most important thing and the soul ignored, then what's the use of a big strong body if it's not doing anything? It's purposeless. In fact, a guy would build this beautiful home and ornate furniture and everything in it, but nobody would live in it. It'd be a museum. What would be the purpose of a museum? Other than telling people what the past was, if you want to utilize it for a positive thing, it has to be a living experience. It has to be utilized. What's the purpose of having just things? It has to be light. It has to be living. So Kabbalah, the perfect uni unity between the soul and the body, life. And any disunity, any disconnection between any part of the soul and the body, death. That's what it calls death. That is not when you die and the medical examiner comes. That's a physical death. But spiritual death is much worse. And that is when there's no connection between the soul and the body. Total disconnect. Do you have any spiritual purpose in doing this physical thing? No. That act is called a dead act. Meaningless. It has no purpose. It's not getting you anywhere. It's not moving you forward. It's not advancing your needs. It's not helping you grow. You're just there. You're just existing. Thank God, Kabbalah says, you could undo the past. You could live many, many years of nothingness, and when you do something finally that's good, you validate all the previous things that you do. You take everything along with you. So it becomes a continuation. So how can a person live their life spiritually? Not by doing spiritual things. It's by doing physical things in alignment with the soul. It's not about spiritual things. Prayer is spiritual, but that's nice. You can't pray 24 hours a day 
and have a meaningful life. It has to be brought down to the physical world. The more a person can bring things into the physical world, the more meaningful their life becomes. So Kabbalah says, what's harder? To fast on Yom Kippur and serve God that way? Or to eat three meals a day and serve God that way? Kabbalah says it's infinitely harder to eat and serve God. Because to fast, you don't eat and that's it. You fulfill the mitzvah. Don't eat. 25 hours passed, okay, I didn't eat. That's only not doing something. Not doing something doesn't create good. There's a restriction by not eating. On the day of Yom Kippur, we feel uplifted. We kind of feel in a different atmosphere. We're forcing ourselves into a realm which we otherwise would not experience. But that's a negative. How do you create positive? By learning how to eat. By learning how to sleep. By learning how to communicate to another person in the proper way. Then we begin to live. Because then our life becomes meaningful. Every single, everything we do becomes important. And this is one of the reasons, according to Kabbalah, that food became such an important part of serving God. Abraham. Abraham is in his tent. God tells him to have a circumcision. He's 99 years old. There's people jump out of planes at 80 because they have to prove something. Abraham is 99 years old. And God says, it's time for a circumcision. Fine. The third day after a circumcision, especially for adults, is supposed to be the hardest. That's like the peak of the pain and the suffering. And then it, cool, it goes down, it comes down afterwards. So on the third day of the circumcision, everybody knows the famous story. He's lying in bed, quenching in agony. And he sees three people walking. And what does he do? He runs out and he greets them and he feeds them. And they tell him that he's going to have a baby boy. And then Isaac is born the following year. And the rest is... Uh, the rest is, you know the rest of the story. Why food? Why didn't he invite them in to study with him? Why didn't he invite them in to uh, have a conversation about something spiritual? After all, there's an opinion that he knew that they were angels, they weren't people. Why didn't he have a spiritual conversation with them? If a person is a real good host and a guest comes, no matter how knowledgeable that person is, the real host will always serve them something to eat first. Say, you know, we have a lot to catch up on, old friends, but let's eat. Not we read the whole story and then let's eat. That's not the way the story is supposed to go. It's supposed to say, let's eat and then we'll talk about the story. Because food is very important. If you don't know how to serve God through eating, if you can't connect to your spiritual component through eating, you're not, you're not, uh, you're not alone in the world. But it's a greater Opportunity. It's a greater challenge to learn how to do physical, materialistic things in a spiritual component, in a spiritual atmosphere. It's much harder than to do it, than to just not do something physical. Restrain yourself. Live, a, live an ascetic lifestyle where you remove yourself from physical pleasures. That's easy to do. That doesn't make you whole. There's a funny story about a rabbi who uh, who had a student who wasn't very intelligent. And the student opened up a book of Kabbalah and he started reading and it says over there that if you sit 40 days and you don't eat anything except barley and you don't speak gossip about anybody else, then you will merit that Elijah the prophet will appear to you. So he spends 40 days eating only barley and he doesn't say a word to anybody. And after 40 days, he's waiting. Sunset comes and nothing happens. Elijah the prophet didn't appear. So he goes to his rabbi and he starts crying. He says, I don't understand that. Look, I read what it says. These are the instructions of how Elijah should appear to you. I, I, I did it. So the, he's walking the rabbi out. The rabbi is walking out. And he's ready to go on a trip. And he goes over to the horse that's standing in front of the horse and wagon. And he pats the horse on the head. The rabbi says, you know this horse? He's been eating barley for 40 days and he hasn't spoken a word of gossip. <laughs> you know, that's not all what it takes. It's a little bit more involved. So just, just not doing certain things, it doesn't make you spiritual. And people think that there's a quick fix. It doesn't work that way. Kabbalah is an incredible 
tool, but it requires an incredible amount of self-discipline. It requires a willingness to do what is unconventional, to go out of your own box, so to speak, out of your preconceived limitations, and to do things which it takes effort to do. It may be easier to go to your doctor and take some drugs which they have a recall later on than to do some of these exercises of Kabbalah. Absolutely. The Rambam, Maimonides, who wrote a book which mentions nothing about Kabbalah, uh, later on Kabbalists looked at his books and found that some of the most profound concepts of Kabbalah were hinted in his book. And in his book he writes that out of every thousand people that die, 999 die from self-imposed causes, human error if you will, and one out of the thousand dies of natural causes. That's what he writes. And he was a doctor before he was a rabbi. He says the amount of abuse that a person gives their own body the neglect that we give ourselves is the cause of our early demise. And if he says people would learn to train to have discipline on themselves and learn how to act in accordance to basic medical practices, then we would live longer. And the reason we don't is because we choose to ignore them. So recognizing that the body is an extremely important part of our spiritual life. It's not just about the soul. It's about recognizing the importance of the body and the role that the body plays and how important it is that our body should be healthy. And what does it take? Physically, we'll discuss next week. But tonight I want to talk about mental attitude and what Kabbalah talks about the way we think. According to Kabbalah, a huge amount of things change by thinking. Thinking. People think thinking is the least of our physical capabilities of changing. I tell people, stop doing that. Go here, come here. That's going to create change. I will make them stop. True. If I physically go and I restrain them, that's even a better way to get them to stop. Especially if they're your children. But mentally, spiritually, intellectually, thinking, how can I create change thinking? Kabbalah says that you have a greater effect on the world <coughs> around you and on your immediate environment and yourself through mental effect, through attitude of thinking, more than speech and more than action. I don't know how you quantify that, how you measure that, but you could force people to do things, you can impose your will on people, and that's going to affect a certain degree of change, but mentally creating a positive mental atmosphere in your mind has the greatest impact for change. That's the way you're supposed to think about the world at large, and it's supposed to be the way you think about yourself. You go to a doctor, and the doctor says, something, bad news, whatever it is, fill in the blank. What's our first reaction? Negative thinking. There's, there's unreasonable thinking, and that is the doctor doesn't know what he's talking about, I'll go to a second opinion, he can't possibly know, I'll live in denial. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a positive mental way of thinking. Suppose it's true. Suppose the doctor is right. And suppose this condition does exist. Does that mean that it can't change? Do I believe that there's a capability that, that the potential for such a change exists? So I would ask the doctor, does, is this a death sentence? Is this 100-0? Or is it 75-25? Is it 50-50? They say a story in 1978 when the Lubavitcher Rebbe suffered a massive heart attack, uh, the doctors urged him to go to the hospital. We were in the middle of the dancing of Simchat Torah. And the doctors told me he should go to the hospital for his own benefit. And he, didn't, he refused to go. And eventually, basically, the hospital came to him. They brought all EKG equipment and all 
uh, heart monitors or whatever needed to be able to recuperate, and a few weeks later I recuperated. And this is in 1970. It's the 1977 uh, when he was 75 years old, and all of his accomplishments really started afterwards. But at that time, one of the doctors, a Jewish doctor, a chassid, said to the Rebbe the following words. He said, if you don't go to the hospital, there's a 75% chance that you'll have another heart attack. And we can help you in the hospital, we can't help you here. So the Rebbe said, you're saying there's a 25% chance that I can cure myself here? He said, Rebbe, you're not listening. And he got upset. He was irate. He said, Rebbe, you have to go. There's a 75%, I'm telling you medically. The Rebbe said, I hear you saying there's a 25%. I'll take the 25%. I'll work with it. Maybe the 25 will become 35 and 40 before you know it. If you assume the negative, like we all naturally do, and that's not a sin, that's the way we're born. We think in terms of our own survival, and the negative instinct immediately sets in. We have to train ourselves to change the attitude, to change the way we think, to think positively. In Yiddish there's an expression, I couldn't find it in Kabbalistic terms, but I'm sure it originates somewhere, either in a book that was written or will be. <laughs> that's called... Tracht gut, wet sein gut. Think good and it will be good. And I thought about that a lot. I said, what does that mean? The doctor just gives you a diagnosis. So now I'm going to think the diagnosis away? That's the way it works? I could just sing along my life? That's not what it means. It doesn't say do nothing and think good. It doesn't discuss doing. Of course you have to do everything possible. Of course you're going to take every possible avenue. But you're not going to give up. You're not going to succumb to the mentality that all is lost and nothing can be done. You're helpless. It's hopeless. That's not a positive way of thinking. It's not a positive way to think about yourself, and it's surely not a positive way of thinking in sharing about another person's pain. So can thinking positively about other people work? Absolutely. Not only absolutely, but that's the only thing we can do. Unless you're a medical professional and you can do something to help that person, which then you're obligated to do, then the only thing you can do is think good. So why would you rob another person of that opportunity? So we are forbidden to think negatively. We recognize, we're realistic, but we think positively. Changing the way we think. And we use negative terms. We use negative words to ourselves instead of having a positive words. Think about some of the words that you talk to yourself about every day. Oh, it probably won't work. Oh, I, it, 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 they probably will say no. Instead of, they'll, they'll say yes. If they'll say no, then I'll have the next opportunity. I'll move along. Instead of seeing the life as a one long continuation and a string of problems, look at them as opportunities. Every single opportunity. Kabbalah explains that the Hebrew word for a test that God gives a person, in the Hebrew is called nisayon. Nisayon literally means to be tested, to be proven. So God gives Abraham ten tests to see if he was really loyal. The Jewish people in the desert, after they left Egypt, were tested ten times. Not always did we pass, but we were tested. What does the word test mean? So Kabbalah explains like this. It's very profound. That the Hebrew word for nisayon, for test, comes from the word nes. Nes means a banner. Something that's placed on top of a mountain. When you win the war, you don't stick the banner that you won the war in the bottom in a pit somewhere, in a closet. You put it in the highest point, Iwo Jima. Here's our flag. We won the war. But how, as high as you can make it, that's where the flag shines. I didn't know until recently there's a law in the United States that the American flag has to be the highest flag of all the flags that you fly. So if you fly a bunch of different flags, legally, the, the flag has to, it's, it's an insult to the flag if it's not higher. Because it means that everything's equal. No, America's higher, above everybody else. All the flags, all wonderful, the American flag has to fly above. 
That comes from the Hebrew word nes, which also is a flag. So the word nes, a Kabbalah explains, means to be uplifted. Arum misi ala harum, that person is climbing a mountain. So a person reluctantly doesn't want to climb a mountain, doesn't want to face. God wants to give you an opportunity that you should rise to a higher level. You should rise to the occasion. You should gr become greater. So, but he offers you the opportunity. You say, no thanks. So he puts us into a crisis. And what comes out of the crisis is one of two things. Either we implode and we give up and we resign to the ultimate, obviously everything's just going to be terrible, so why even bother? Which means failing the test. The other opportunity, the other way of looking at it, is that this is an opportunity. God would never give me a problem I couldn't handle. I'm going to do whatever I can. And all of a sudden, we get this incredible amount of energy we never knew we had to deal with this new crisis. And what happens? We become a new person. Abraham became greater. He, he was forced up the mountain of spiritual growth by being given these tests. God says to him, you know what? Don't live here. Go to a land, a better place. A land that I will show you is much better. The land of Canaan. He arrives at the land, opens up the first day to Canaan, daily famine. Everybody leaving. Nobody staying. He can look at God and say, you know what? Was this a game? You tell me to leave a place of plenty to a place that's much better. I come to the place and there's a famine in the land. But he doesn't complain. What does he realize? He realizes that this is a challenge. And either I could say, God, I'm not willing to take the challenge. Like the Jewish comedian says, find somebody else, choose somebody else for a change. Or I'm going to rise to the occasion. For whatever reason, God wants me to face this challenge. So how, do I, how am I supposed to live? Am I supposed to live by dying just to say I'm here? I'll go to the land of Egypt. And it comes out of the land of Egypt wealthy. Another stage. So God forces us, forces us up these notches of life against our will, by giving us incredible opportunities. And Kabbalah never calls them problems. They're never problems. They're opportunities of spiritual growth. You can fail or succeed. If you fail most of the time, you're average. If you pass all the time, you're a tzaddik like Abraham, and you should be put in the Bible. <laughs> Most of us fail. It's okay to fail. It's human to fail. You make mistakes. We fail. God gave us an opportunity. We fail. <coughs> there was a king in the Jewish uh, history, uh, King David's grandson. His name was Chizkiah. I think Hezekiah is called in English. And God told him, the prophet comes and he says, I want you to know that there's a king, a wicked king, and he's going to come and he's going to attack you, and you're going to win the war decisively. So you know what he does? He goes to sleep. He says, if God just told me I'm going to win the war decisively, what do I have to even send someone to battle for? So the prophet sees him, goes to sleep, and says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to bed. He says, what do you mean? You can't go to bed, there's a war. But you just said, God said, I'm going to win the war. Why do I have to bother? So Kabbalah says, and he didn't send anyone to war. And uh, this king goes, and this Assyrian army masses around Jerusalem, and miraculously, they back off and the war is over. Chizkiah was right. The king said, if I meant to survive this challenge, I'll survive it. I don't have to do anything about it. That was the ultimate submission. Not denial, but submission. There's a huge difference between not taking responsibility or giving God all the responsibility. He said, you can handle it better than I can. I'm giving the job to you. And he went to sleep. I need Yashanam. He told I'm going to go to bed, and God's going to take care of it for me. There are times when that is the proper attitude, because nothing else can be done. If there's something you can do, you're obligated to do it. You can't sleep a moment. You must tend to the problem 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as soon as the problem is beyond your hands, you pass it on to God. You say, God, I did everything I can. Unless there's something I missed that you're going to give me some, some wisdom over here, I've done everything I can for the problem. I've contacted everybody I know. I've, I've used every resource possible, and that's it. What's left, I'm putting in your hands. 
before we go to bed. In your hands, I give my soul. We're not scared to give God our soul. We're not scared He's not going to give it back to us in the morning. He's the most protective custody He could possibly have. What's if we give our life to God even during the daytime? You say, listen, I'm about to face a challenge. I have absolutely no idea how am I going to do it. So I'm going to ask you to do it for me. I'm going to walk into the room and say whatever I have to say, and the rest is yours. And that's okay. Because we learn, we do everything we can, and the rest goes to God's hands. That attitude is extremely important for practical daily living. Even if we're not ill, even if we have no medical problems, even if we don't have any emotional, spiritual problems, that attitude itself is the cause of an incredible amount of healing that will help us and enable us to be able to grow. Because that is a proper way of thinking. Every descent is for an ascent. We will discuss this in class many, many times. Yerida Tzorech Aliyah. A descent going down is only in order that there should be a greater rise. God never pushes us down unless He wants the spring to go way high. And it can't go high unless we go down. So you bend down to make a big jump. You take a step back to make a, to make a greater leap forward. That's the way life is. We don't want to be bothered, so we trudge along little step by step, as little as we possibly have to do, just to survive so we can justify our existence. But once in a while, God gives us a little pinch in our backside, and all of a sudden we jump. All of a sudden we jump far. It's a challenge. But the challenge makes us realize really what we're capable of. And human beings, give, we give ourselves very little credit for what our capabilities are. We, we imagine ourselves very uh, minimal in terms of what our capabilities are. We don't think of ourselves in the maximum possible way. And it's extremely important to have a, uh, an attitude where you are capable of doing everything possible and not being fearful that you don't have control over everything. It's okay. You don't have to have the answers to everything. And it doesn't mean you can't start because you don't have the answers to everything. You have to have all the information before you start. Do you know the combustible uh, effects of a transmission and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, um, a motor in a car before you start the car? No. I like what the car looks like on the outside. I like the color. The seats are comfortable. Get you from one place to the other. That's it. Where's because this is a problem. I'll call a friend who knows how to tinker under a hood of a car. I don't even want to look. I'll give it away to somebody. Let someone else deal with it. That's how we deal with life. Get ourselves spiritual Bentleys and Maseratis and I don't know what the fanciest car today's are. And, um, and, and take the challenge. Great, Take great opportunities. And will they be challenging? Sure they will be. And when the problem comes and we'll have to deal with something we don't know, we'll worry about it then. But that will make us alive. That will make us live in the true sense of it. It all boils down to wanting to take control of what we're capable of doing and having the discipline to follow through. Like I said, it's much easier to sit in the doctor's room, to sit in the hospital bed, and, and to be able to just say, you know, we're not dealing with the problem. Fix me. Wake me up when it's over. I don't want to have any pain. Take it all away. I just, I just want to wake up five days from now and everything should be fine. But it doesn't work that way. Sometimes the greatest challenge is fixing the problem ourselves. And we have the ability to do it. We have the potential within us to be able to create the change. We are our best actors because who knows us personally, ourselves, except us. We know what we need. We don't want to take the bother. We don't want to take the effort. But if we really try, there's an incredible amount of self-help that we have. You don't need to find it somewhere. We need to ask ourselves these basic questions. What is it going to take for me to do this? What kind of self-discipline do I have? Can I, do I have the self-control to be able to do what I really know I want to do? And sometimes it's not in the knowledge, it's in the willingness to be able to take the awareness of what is good or what is right and actually doing it against our physical judgment. So to recap, the concept of the soul and the body and the healing that takes place between the two is a real deep and essential awareness of what the body is, being aware of all the components of our body, 
and recognizing that there's a spiritual energy, if you will, just for lack of better terms, until we understand what a soul is and we get more involved in the classes, let's talk about soul like energy. If you want the energy to flow, you can't have any blockage. You can't put something in between the light and the object and expect the light to pass through. You put a blockage there, the light won't pass through. The soul has to reach all components of the body. You can't have any blockages. You can't have any distractions. You can't have anything in between. Mental negativity is the greatest fog, the greatest distraction. There's many other distractions possible, but those the things of the mental nature is the greatest problem. Once you remove the mental, then you'll see physical things in the way. You'll see tables and chairs and all these other things that sometimes obviously will move away. But the mental attitudes are hardest to because we don't believe it has any importance, we don't believe it has any influence, you don't really see much. It's just in the mind. So I thought, good today, so now what? My day's better? I don't see any improvement. We want, we want instant change. And spiritually, the greatest effect that we can have in our body is linking this spirit, this energy to our body, each and every part. And again, I'm not talking about finding a problem to fix of some kind of illness necessarily, although that's also true. Just the health of the body, the awareness that there is a positive energy, a positive attitude about life, that itself is the greatest uh, conductivity of change that can possibly happen. And if we realize that, then we are able to change ourselves. Because within us exists the change. Kabbalah says that in order for the world to experience peace, every person has to have peace. If you take all the, the, the guns and all the swords and all the ammunition and all the nuclear weapons from the whole world and gather to one big valley and explode it, and there's nothing left, people will be happy? That's not how you get rid of problems in the world. World peace begins with each and every person having peace in their own heart, in their own mind, their own soul. You have to have an atmosphere of peace. We talked last week about creating this, this image of Noah existing in this torrential rain and flood and everyone's getting destroyed because no one had the mental attitude that Noah had. Anyone that would have, would have been in the ark. By definition, they chose to live a lifestyle that there was no place for positive change. It was a destructive place. Even the destructive people said, it's all terrible, everyone's shooting each other. Even I'm shooting people, we're all shooting. That's what we do. And anyone who had a positive attitude would have been in the ark. So we create change, each individual person. Don't look at the world like the world's making the problems. You know who's the greatest person you should elect for November 2nd? Elect yourself. Say, I want to change. I don't know what President Bush is going to do. I don't know if, uh, if uh, Senator Kerry is going to become the president. You know what? If either of them become president, if they both become president or neither, it's not going to affect your life. It's not going to affect you or yourself. It will be the greatest effect in your life. Because there are people in the greatest time of plenty that are fetching and complaining. And there are people in the worst time that are happy. Because they themselves say, I'm not going to lower myself to the lowest common denominator. I'm going to rise to the occasion. And I'm going to make something out of it. Those are the people that succeed in the business world because they take the opportunity. When everybody's fetching and complaining about the problems in the world, that's when we look for the opportunities. Because when does the growth begin? When everyone's complaining that everything looks bleak. That's the change. Just conclude with a quick story. There was a, uh, a seminar that lasted uh, for four days about personal growth and self-help and so on. And the lecturer concluded the, 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 the entire seminar, the entire weekend, with the following story. They said that there were two children that were being psychologically tested. One was the pessimist and one was the optimist. A child completely optimistic and the other child completely pessimistic. And they took the pessimist and they bought every, sh every, sto every toy that F.A.O. Schwartz sold and put them in a room the size of a, a hollow Walmart <laughs> and filled every toy in there and put them in a the room. He said, we'll be back in an hour. In the other room, they took hay and straw, straw and manure from a horse 
and put it in the other room, and they put the optimist kid in that room. They said, we'll be back in an hour. They opened up the door an hour later. The pessimist kid sitting in the middle of the room, all the toys around him is crying. <laughs> so the guy comes over to me and says, Johnny, why are you crying? What's the matter? He says, you know, I was looking for this toy in red. This toy doesn't, it's not as high as I wanted it to be. This toy, I couldn't get through to do this. And every toy was a problem. And if I only had a different kind, then I would be happy. But not, none of these toys really fits my needs. I open up the other room, and this kid is sitting in this huge pile of the aforementioned, <laughs> and he's throwing it around like it's, like he's having the fun of his life. So the teacher says, the, 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 the instructor says, Pete, what are you doing? He says, with all this crap in here, there's got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> That be a joke that we could tell many times in many places. But there's a lot of wisdom to it. Why is there wisdom to it? Because we are like those two kids in different points of our life. Some of us are 90-10 one way, some 90-10 the other way. But we can change the way we look at the world. We can see a problem and say there's got to be something good in this. God would not give me this challenge if there wasn't something in it for me. I don't believe that God's a sadist. So there has to be some benefit. I have to find something. And you know what? If I don't find something, I'm not going to give up. I'll keep on trying. God tells Abraham, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom. It's a wicked place. And if I'll tell you some of the stories, I don't have time. The incredible, horrific depths that these people went to, sunk, to be able to be uh, the most inhumane people to each other. Forget about morality in terms of godliness and, and respecting law and order. Just to each other, to their own family, to their own kin. It was horrible. And God goes to Abraham and he says to him, You know what, Abraham? I'm going to destroy Sodom. What's his first reaction? Maybe there's some righteous people there. Maybe the city could be saved because of some goodness. You know, after all, God, you created a world, there's a lot of evil, but there's good in it. And you don't want to destroy the world, because it's good. So why would you destroy Sodom? Any zealot today that believes in God would say, God, burn them. They deserve it. I've been, I saw what they did. They, just, they deserve destruction. I want to be there to watch it, because I want to see these people go down. Why would Abraham come up with this mercy thing? After he knew, he read the paper, he knew what's going on. People sp spent time traveling back, back and forth. It says after the story of Sodom that Abraham moved. And the commentators on the Torah tell us that the reason he moved, because there was no more wayfarers passing through. What does that mean? That the people of Sodom were the people that were passing through. So that was his, his that was the service, the guests that he served. So he knew what they were. So why would he have this instant reaction of compassion. Because when God gives us a challenge, when he says a nuclear war, a war is about to happen, he's not saying, I want to see. Like, we like the news because we hope to see some horrible thing happen. That's how we are. We have this sadistic nature within ourselves. We want to see some blood. We want to see, let's see the thing happen. Don't cut it off before it's over. I want to see what happens. That's how we are. And that's why there's such high ratings for these kinds of news. Abraham's first reaction is, not only don't I want to look, not only don't I want to be a voyeur, I want to know why you're doing it. I know the same thing you know, God, but aren't there something of redeeming value in that place? And after God says no, then he backs off. But his instant reaction is, what can I do? Where is there a place for me to fit in? And if there's a place, I want to be there. If there isn't, no problem. Hey, God, you're running the world. You created it. You're in charge. But if you're asking me to step in, I have to do something positive. And that's how we should look at our life. Don't look at it like a death sentence. Don't look at it like some horrible thing about to happen. Take the challenge, take the opportunities, grow with them. They're going to fail, they're going to succeed, of course. Don't be so great. You know, Golden Mayor say, don't be so humble, you're not that great. 
You know, in order to be so full of yourself that you can't make a mistake. Hey, I made a mistake. I'm sorry. I tried. It didn't work. You fall on your face. But if you really want to learn how to ride a bicycle, you fall a few times. If you really want to learn how to drive a car, you know, hit a few bumps. That's the way life is. And that's how we grow. That's how we move from one stage to the other. So next week's class, we will talk about some of the practical applications, not just a roundabout, but something specific about specific healing, some of the approaches that uh, Kabbalah has to modern day healing, some of the homeopathy that's out there and other things like that, which I'm sure will prove to be uh, very interesting and, uh, and informative. And I want to thank you all very, very much for coming. I also want to take this opportunity to thank the few volunteers who've offered to help, uh, Jill Schwartz and uh, Karen Maidenick and her, and her daughter and uh, others who are helping. And if you want to be on the volunteer list, Pearl, please. <laughs> You want to stand for me? Uh, absolutely. I don't, I, I don't want to mention, I may miss somebody, but everyone who helped, if you want to be on the volunteer committee to help, we, uh, we hope next week to be able to open up the, uh, the shul for a large audience. And uh, we thank you very, very much for coming tonight. Thank you.